We're so glad you were able to make the trip to Woods Hole. We ordered this weather just for you. <laughs> no, it's actually supposed to clear up this afternoon. My name is Heather Benway. Uh, I believe the mic is working. Um, yeah, Val is checking sound back there. You can all hear me, right? All right, I guess, I guess, yes. all right. So my name is Heather Benway. I'm the executive officer of the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry Project Office. And I also, also want to introduce, although he needs no introduction, Mike Patterson. I don't know where he went, but he is the director of US Climar. He's getting coffee. He's getting coffee. Um, I think most of you know Mike as well. Um, and I want to introduce Jenny Zhu from U.S. Clybar and Mae Mahegan from the OCP office. Um, and our scientific organizing committee also needs no introduction. They're listed here and they will be up here moderating sessions throughout. Really looking forward to this. U.S. Clybar and OCB have been collaborating for quite some time now on a number of, of different scientific topics. And we've found that our communities are really collaborative and, and complementary in their expertise. So it's been a really fantastic, almost, what, over a decade now? Yeah, 12 years. 12 years of collaboration. So this is just the latest um, ecological forecasting, bringing together the biogeochemistry and marine ecosystem function expertise of the OCB community with the more dynamic climate dynamics and physical expertise of the Clivar community. So. Really excited about the workshop. We just have a couple of details we want to start with. Um, we'd like to fun, uh, thank our funding agency sponsors who are listed across the top of this slide. Um, without them, none of this would be possible. And how do I advance the slides? <laughs> I guess I just have to do it. The arrows are. Oh. <laughs> All right, awesome. So I first would like to acknowledge that the OCB Project Office and HUI are located on the ancestral lands of the Wampanoag Nation, which is made up of the Mashpee, Aquina, and Herring Pond tribes. This is an important land acknowledgement for this whole region, and we, we would like to certainly acknowledge if anybody would like to take a moment to think about the ancestral lands that they are working on. I don't know why these arrows don't work for me, but I'm just going to manually advance them. So just a few things. We want to set a really inclusive and important tone here. Um, our workshop code of conduct, we want to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. Um, please don't interrupt. The person who's speaking has the floor. Speak with intention and listen with attention to your colleagues. Um, critique ideas and not individuals. And please tend to the well-being of the collective group as a whole. We will not tolerate any sort of harassment, bullying, intimidation, or discrimination of any form, um, physical or verbal abuse of any kind, or deliberate disruption of presentations or any form of communication. Please be observant, be an ally. If you experience or witness anything, please report it to Heather, myself, May, or Jenny. We are here and we are listening. Um, so please come to us if you experience any problems. So no fighting behind the playground or any kind of funny business. Um, we have the agenda printed on all of the tables. And most of you have a copy, and it's also online. So if you need extra copies, they are out there. You can also find a lot of the important meeting information, especially concerning the breakout sessions, both <laughs> online and printed out on the board over there on the posters. If any of you have posters that you've brought and would like to hang them up on the poster boards, feel free. There are thumbtacks on the registration table. And I hope everybody has had something to eat, something to drink. There are bathrooms right behind the auditorium, and I think that's all. Am I forgetting anything? Well, it would be good for the in-person audience, if you're describing something on your slide, to be very descriptive, because the, audience, the virtual audience won't know if you're like, this graph over here. They won't know what that graph is, so if you could describe it, that'd be great. 
be descriptive and, and be mindful that we have an entire, I mean, almost as many people as are in this room are online participating in this workshop. So please be mindful of that. And um, if you can repeat questions or speak very loudly, um, that would be good too, because the acoustics are, are limited. <laughs> Yeah, so I also wanted to mention to everybody here, we've been through a couple, U.S. Clybar, this is our third hybrid meeting that we're holding, and we find that it's really important for everybody in the room to only speak into a microphone. So we'll have, we have a number of microphones here that will rush around the room to get to you when you raise your hand. Um, that way everybody online can hear you, and likewise, those online, when they're asking their question, you'll be able to hear them in the room. So we want this to be as seamless as possible in terms of the exchange of information with the people online and those in the room. So um, just raise your hand and when you're called on, we'll get the, we'll get the um, microphone to you. Be sure to speak in it clearly, slowly, so everyone can hear you. Thanks. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep an eye on sound. We have um, Val, I want to introduce Val, who's our hero for today, our technical <laughs> hero, um, making all of this as seamless as possible. And he's going to be monitoring sound. So if the microphones get too boomy, we'll will um, change tack as needed. So with that, I want to introduce um, Matt Newman to come on up and start moderating your session. Oh, Antonetta, I'm sorry. So the, the chairs, um, the chair, Antonietta Capacondi, is going to give a couple of intro slides before we kick off our session. Uh, this one, just work. Click on those because okay. those don't work. Okay. And uh, so, should I just speak from here? Yes. Yes. Okay. As long as I love this, I can. That's hard for me. Okay, so um, welcome everybody to this workshop. As uh, Heather has uh, said, this is a joint workshop between uh, OCB and uh, US Cliver. And uh, it has been in the making for a while. So it was in fact first uh, originally scheduled for September last year. So I feel that you know, we are really lucky. It's really a gift that we can be here today in this beautiful place with the sun in the afternoon, as we were told, <laughs> um, you know, so with so many of us in person, which is uh, kind of a new and exciting thing. Oops. Ah, OK, good. Okay, so um, this workshop was originally conceived uh, as uh, an extension of uh, a previous workshop that was held in La Hoya in August 2016. And the title of that was Forecasting Enso Impact on Marine Ecosystem um, of the U.S. West Coast. So, of course, the U.S. West Coast is kind of a relatively easy problem because Enso controls a lot of the predictability in that area. Uh, but, however, like... Uh, um, physical, biological, ecological prediction are also important along all of the U.S. coastlines. And so uh, the idea is to extend that workshop to other regions and also across temporal and spatial scales, so from the open ocean to the coast to the estuarine levels, and also across time scale from Delhi to decadal and to climate change and beyond uh, decadal. Um, so... <clears throat> And so it's important to explore the sources of predictability along all of the U.S. coastline and their potential application in particular to societal relevant um, forecasting success. So the goals of the workshop are to explore the connection between the large-scale physical, biogeochemical, and ecological processes and coastal processes, identify sources of predictability across temporal scale, from Delhi to Decadal, uh, along the U.S. coastline, including in particular U.S. West Coast, Arctic, East Coast, and Gulf of Mexico, and assess the suitability and needs for observation that characterize the key processes, their interaction across scales, and their response to climate change, and assess the major gaps, whether conceptual, computational, methodological, or observational, that limit our ability to produce forecasts at the scales that are needed by management along the U.S. coastline. 
and identify avenues for accelerating progress. So it's a very ambitious uh, uh, task that we are going to have in these uh, uh, two and a half days. Um, and so the workshop aims is actually really to provide uh, um, an ample opportunity for discussion, sharing of research ideas and methodological approaches in order to collectively develop a vision for how to fill gaps, motivate new research, and strategically develop for a casting application across a range of time and space scale around the U.S. coastlines. So we have assembled a fantastic uh, uh, group of uh, attendees, participants, and uh, experts, really with a broad range of expertise and interest, and uh, we really hope that we can hear from everybody. <coughs> So the topics, so this morning, we are going to hear about sources of predictability in different regions. This afternoon, we are going to um, uh, discuss application of ecological forecasting in a different time scales. Then tomorrow, in the morning, we, have, we discuss modeling capability and challenges, and then in the afternoon, reanalysis and observations. And then on Thursday morning, we will synthesize all we have uh, heard and discussed and try to um, uh, highlight or try to um, devise future directions. Okay. So the way the workshop is structured, so about to mo today, this morning and tomorrow morning, we are going to start with our keynote presentation, then we are going to have a break, then we are going to have short talks, five minutes each, which will inject other ideas into the major topics. And they will be followed by a discussion uh, of all these ideas that we have heard. And uh, we'll go then in breakout session before lunch. And the afternoon is very similar, except um, toward the end of the day, we are going to have some unstructured time just for uh, informal discussion and uh, poster viewing. And then on Thursday morning, we are going to have the last breakout session, the breakout reports, and then uh, ample time for discussion to uh, really um, pin down kind of future steps for uh, progress. And so there are, uh, Heather already has uh, anticipated this, but there are really many people and uh, organizations that we need to thank. First of all, the Scientific Organizing Committee, in particular my wonderful co-chair, Victoria Coles, who is sitting somewhere here, and then Sophie Clayton, Margie Frederick, Michelle Dirac, Art Miller, and Charlie Stock. Our sponsors, so OCB and US Cliver, as well as NOAA, NSF, DOE, and NASA. And they're really the program organizing committee, Heather, Cindy, May, Mike, Mary, and Jenny, who, whose help and uh, support has been phenomenal. So um, thank you to everybody. And I think this time we call Ma <laughs> Matt on the podium for starting the first uh, oral session. And we're going to have Michelle, I think, on uh, joining us from uh, Pasadena. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Matt Newman. Uh, I'm going to uh, moderate the session. Uh, Michelle will be online. Um, again, just to remind you, uh, as Mike said earlier, uh, you're not present in the meeting if you're not on the mic. So it's worth kind of keeping that in mind. People online cannot hear you if you're not mic. So when you have questions, please wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, OK, so our, uh, each speaker is going to have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, and then we will have five minutes for questions. Uh, I'll, I'll give a high sign to the speakers with five minutes left in their 20 minutes, so at 15 minutes. Uh, first up is Mike Jaycox from NOAA Southwest Fisheries Center and uh, NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory. Uh, he's online and he will be speaking on timescales and mechanisms of marine ecosystem predictability along the U.S. West Coast. Okay, Mike, the floor is yours. All right, thanks very much, Matt. And uh, sorry to not be there with you all. Um, but actually, I am very close to that photo that's across the banners of all the slides <laughs> for the workshop. <laughs> it's in Monterey, right outside my office. Um, but anyway, nice to hear a room full of live applause. Um, so I'm going to try to kick us off um, talking about 
sort of predictability along U.S. coastlines generally, and then with a more detailed view of the West Coast. Um, and I think a nice place to start there is uh, this slide from a paper by Desiree Tomasi et al. that I use as a motivation for this type of talk a lot. Um, but basically, the uh, type of plot that people are familiar with, the sort of Stommel plot with space and time scales, but in this case, highlighting some of the fisheries uh, relevant decisions that happen across those space and time scales. Um, and then some of the sort of climate phenomena that map on uh, to those same scales. With the idea, idea being both that there are decisions that need to be made across the daily to decadal and beyond scales, but also that there are climate phenomena that could be um, used to generate predictability um, to be applied to those decisions. So I sort of got into this realm, I guess, about the time of that workshop that Anton Yetta mentioned that ENSO um, predictability associated with ENSO workshop in 2016. And shortly after that, there was a call from the NOAA Climate Program Office um, that led to a, uh, a bunch of proposals being funded on living marine resource uh, prediction. And so from 2017 to 2020, there was a marine prediction task force. Um, that a lot of people uh, at this workshop were involved with. And there were a couple of products that came out of that, and one of them was a review paper uh, that tried to get at these questions of like mechanisms of predictability for uh, marine ecosystem, marine ecosystems and, and the types of tools that can be used. Um, so I'll just show a couple of the sort of summary findings from that. Um, and this is meant to be a sort of U.S. coastline specific view of some of the mechanisms that can generate predictability. Um, and the focus of this work was really on sort of seasonal time scales, uh, one month out to say two years. But I think there are they're applicable to longer time scales and, and shorter time scales too, probably into the sub seasonal realm. Um, but we identified some key physical processes. And again, this would apply to all U.S. coastlines anything from uh, like coastal trapped waves going up the coast um, on the time scales of, of weeks to months maybe um, persistence just things sort of evolving slowly um, sea ice re-emergence of anomalies um, maybe from winter to winter and then rock sea waves advection and the tropical extra tropical connections again which Anthony had to mention particularly related to and so really important for the west coast and then also on the biogeochemical and ecological side, where there are both responses to the physical forcing um, or the environment, but then also inherent properties of species that might be um, that might give some predictability. So a couple of these for my talk are less relevant to the U.S. West Coast, the sea ice, um, but I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that from Mitch in talking about the Arctic and the Bering Sea in a little bit, and then the. Vericlinic Rossi waves as well, although I will say that um, since we don't have a Pacific Islands talk uh, in this session, that the Rossi waves can be an important source of predictability there um, for things like sea level anomalies and potentially predicting things like nuisance flooding. So then moving from the mechanisms of predictability to some of the tools, there's a, there's a nice suite of tools that I think we'll hear a lot about in this workshop. Um, but anything from global to regional models, all kinds of ecosystem models, and then observations. And these things can be connected in all kinds of different ways, statistically or dynamically, to produce forecasts uh, and projections across different time scales. So I'll show the example that, uh, that we started with in, in my group um, in trying to sort of put these things together in an application, which was this idea of this uh, fisheries bycatch avoidance tool called EcoCast. So the basic idea is um, to take a global climate forecast, use it to downscale a uh, regional model for the California current system, and then take the environmental layers from that regional ocean model to predict the habitat suitability for uh, several different species. So in this case, the, one of the species, swordfish, is the target of this fishery. Uh, and then 
there are a number of other species like leatherback turtles, California sea lions, and blue sharks that are all bycatch in this fishery. Um, and so the idea is to create a tool that can promote fishing, more sustainable fishing, where you catch what you want to catch and avoid what you don't want to catch. And so you can sort of combine these different layers of different species and weight them appropriately to come up with a product that says, in this case, you know, blue is better fishing grounds and red is, is worse fishing grounds. So in the context of like the available tools and mechanisms that I mentioned before, um, this application, the, the tools, we would use the arrows uh, here where it's going from a global model to a regional model um, with a common a sort of hybrid dynamical and statistical downscaling and then producing a, a physical forecast out of that and also using it to force a, a statistical ecosystem models to produce the ecological forecast. And going in, um, the thought was that the mechanisms that would drive predictability or um, lend us success on this type of an application would be things like persistence, potentially coastal trapped waves on the West Coast, and then these tropical, extra tropical connections, especially associated with ENSO. And then on the ecological side, the direct response of species to their environment, which is captured by species distribution models. So I'll return to this to talk about how well this, this is working out. Um, well, the next thing I wanna do is just sort of step through these time scales um, and talk a bit about different variables and what we find in terms of forecast skill across time scales. Um, so for this, for the seasonal piece, I'm going to talk about the, the regional downscaling that we've done. Um, so just to set the stage for that, uh, this regional ocean model is about 10 kilometer resolution. We're, we're forcing it with a global model, which is actually the Canadian can CM4, our Canadian forecast model. So global climate forecast. Um, and the downscaled runs are initialized twice per year. Uh, and we have a uh, like 29 year historical or sort of reforecast period to test the skill of these forecasts. And all the forecasts run out 12 months and we're, we're doing three met three ensemble members. So that's a subset of the available members, but of course we're computationally limited on the regional side. Um, and then I just wanted to note that, uh, there's other West Coast downscaling work like this going on, and Sam said, lucky we'll talk about it in more depth for the Pacific Northwest. And also that on that sub-seasonal timescale that I'm not going to really cover, that Dylan and I have been working a lot on that and has uh, one of the poster lightning talks today, I think. All right. So this is just an example forecast um, or a, a slice of example forecasts. So I'm looking here at a broad region of the California current, sort of this 300 kilometer band next to the coast, spanning basically the length of the US West Coast uh, in the lower 48 at least. And so on the top, you can just see SST forecast, their average over that domain. Um, these are the January forecast initialized once per year um, relative to the observations in black. And then the bottom is the same thing, but the anomalies and that shading shows the spread. So you can see, obviously their the seasonal cycle looks reasonable. And in terms of anomalies, um, you can sort of see generally a, a tracking between them, which one would expect partially just from the, um, initial conditions and persistence, but then some other places where you're also seeing, uh, some dynamical skill, um, and we can quantify that, of course, uh, which is what's shown here. So this is the anomaly correlation. So it's just the correlation between the forecast anomalies and the observed anomalies across that 29 year period as a function of lead time. And so for SST, um, at short lead time, certainly you have pretty high skill uh, and you have significant skill, which is about the dashed line out to say seven months. So this certainly seems like um, a viable forecast or one that could be uh, ecologically useful. Um, and this was sort of known, you, you know, from global models already. Um, but part of the advantage of the regional models is that we can dive into a uh, larger suite of variables. And so we did that with a bunch of variables that have been used in ecological models in the region. 
Uh, so here's a few more variables added onto this plot. Um, the bottom temperature, sea surface height, and then the uh, upper ocean buoyancy frequency. Um, and so all of these actually have some reasonable skill, it looks like. Um, and I'll admit up the top that these are sort of cherry picked for being the best ones. There's a whole other suite of variables that we've looked at that have much less skill. Things like mixed layer depth and surface currents and winds. Um, and this is another way with five minutes, I don't know how much time I'll spend stepping through this, but this is just another way to visualize that skill. On the left is basically a summary of what I just showed, these January initializations, and now each row is a different variable, um, and the color indicates the skill. So this is just to compare the January versus July, where notably in July, um, if you look at the, the top rows that you see, this sort of skill actually pop out at months, say, 6 to 10. Um, and that's that late winter, early spring, and that's associated, um, seems to be associated with it. And so it's something we've seen in past work. And then this is just to quickly note that there's also regional differences in forecast skill with a general trend towards higher forecast skill in the north and lower forecast skill in the south of the region. All right, so on the multi-annual timescale, I would say there's been less work done, but but more recently, some really interesting stuff done, especially on the uh, global scale. Um, so this is work uh, by John Young Park and Charlie Stock et al. Um, and if you look over at the far right now, you're looking at two-year lead time, where and if you look at SOT along the West Coast, there's not much there. But in some of the biogeochemical variables, there is significant skill in uh, you know, some of the nutrients, oxygen, and even net primary production. And uh, this is sort of driving home that same point with a series of studies. Um, the two on the left using the CESM large ensemble looking at pH on the top and then net primary production on the bottom where there is this multi-year significant skill for the biogeochemical variables. And then on the right, um, work by Mary Zabul and Emmanuel Di Lorenzo. Uh, this is based on observations, but just finding um, skill basically at long leads for the west coast based on anomalies from the central north pacific so in this case it looks like advection um, of subsurface waters is a strong source of predictability on these longer time scales and then so i just want to end up by sort of trying to make a step to linking these physical forecasts and mechanisms to the ecological forecast and so once we've got a reasonable skill assessment on the physical side we can start thinking about what the opportunities might be on the ecological side. So the idea of this table is to gather together a set of applications, sort of non-exhaustive suite of potential applications, and look at the region that they're in, the variables that are needed for the ecological model, and then the time of year that you're trying to forecast. Um, and so this first one is this ecocast tool that I mentioned earlier, which was sort of our target to begin with. And if you look at, now we can go in and look at the skill uh, in the variables needed to force that model. And uh, a lot of the variables have very little skill. And, and it's also actually at a time of year, August to January, that is less predictable than the rest of the year, basically, whether you're initializing forecast in January or July. So it's not to say there might not be something here, but it doesn't seem like an ideal target anyway. Uh, just from this sort of qualitative look at things. Um, by contrast, here's a couple of other potential applications, one to avoid whale entanglement along the West Coast, one for sardine recruitment, following on work by Desiree Tomasi. Um, here, where there's a smaller suite of variables, SST and SSH, and also needed at times of the year when there is significant skill, even, you know, eight, eight or nine or ten months in advance for these July initialized forecasts. So something like that, uh, just from sort of the preliminary um, look at the ecological and physical uh, comparison seems like a good target for a successful application. Right, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Okay, so we have time for questions. Thank <laughs> you.
I'm not sure it's going to work. Because it's a mask for her. Okay. Um, hi, Mike. It's Sam. Thanks. Nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you have thought about these other variables in terms of um, is there hope? You know, are there things that we can try or um, to improve or you know, or potentially like is it isn't the fault of the models or are these fundamentally just not going to be bridgeable in these time scales? What do you think? So the, I think the question was, is there hope for these variables with poor skill? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are definitely, I'm sure, other people in the room that would, I mean, a lot of this, I think, actually is on the atmospheric side of the issue is um, where there's a little predictability in things like winds. Um, I guess maybe, like, I, I don't know how much hope there is for extending out the seasonal forecast skill of some of these things. But I would say that, um, you know, this kind of view of things where the first lead time you're looking at is the first month average might be selling short the potential applications, where for things like the winds or upwelling or something like that, where on the sub-seasonal time scale, there may be more predictability, and that may still be um, may still be viable in terms of some applications. Um, but yeah, in terms of extending out the predictability of something like the wind, I, obviously that's a, a problem people have been working on for a long time. I'm sure there will be slow progress, but I don't think it will be huge in the near term. Hey, uh, anybody else? Are there questions either online? You can just use to raise your hand and unmute in the room. Antoinette. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was going to ask about you mentioned that along the US West Coast there are uh, um, um, sort of prediction, predictions, prediction speed is higher in the northern part than in the southern part. And so I think that clearly the northern part may be the answer influence to the atmosphere is more um, is more robust. Uh, what about like uh, ocean waves? Would it then they uh, lead to some degree of predictability in the southern part of the west west coast? Yeah, so it is pretty hard to hear, but I think you're asking about waves and whether there's whether that might have better predictability in the south. Yes, right. sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yes. no, it's not your fault, it's just a little garbled. Um, yeah, I think, so I'm trying to remember Dylan's results. I, I sh should just at the top say he's going to talk about exactly this. Um, but I think that's right, that the South should get should get more of that forecast skill from the um, coastal trapped waves. And, you know, part of what we found looking at global models with this pattern and skill was that um, kind of counterintuitively that, that ENSO gave predictability more to that northern region, um, I think because the atmospheric teleconnection is captured better than the ocean teleconnection in the model. Um, but it does seem like that oceanic pathway uh, is a place where there might be room for improvement in the models and enhanced predictability, especially in the south. Thanks. Yeah, I asked? I guess I'll ask something just real quick, or maybe it'll end up being something to think about later on. But you didn't uh, talk about probabilistic uh, verification, Mike. I was wondering how much you've looked at that. Um, do you have a sense of whether these downscaling <coughs> forecasts are reliable, for example? Yeah, so I mean, we have three ensemble members, so I'm not sure how much we can say. We've calculated some probabilistic metrics. Um, uh, which show qualitatively the same patterns as the deterministic ones, but I haven't looked at reliability, and I don't know if, if three ensemble members is enough to do that. Maybe you do. Okay. It's, it's borderline, yeah. But it's, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's worth looking at. I think you want to at least be thinking about that going through. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. thank Thanks, uh, Thank you. Thank the speaker again. All right.
our next speaker is uh, Mike Alexander from NOAA's Physical Science Laboratory. I'm pretty sure that's what it says. And uh, he'll be speaking about the northern U.S. East Coast. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, thanks to Mike for showing that space-time diagram to kind of uh, set the stage for thinking across scales, uh, both space and time. Uh, I'm kind of mainly focused on physical processes and kind of uh, step out from kind of simple to more complex. Okay, so um, let's think about uh, some of the most simple ocean we can think of, one that's a fixed depth, it doesn't have currents, um, does interact with the atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere varies very rapidly, so it can provide um, uh, white noise, forcing basically across all kinds of time scales. And then as the ocean warms up or cools down, it, it feeds back, and that feedback tends to damp the SST anomalies. So the equation on the, the right, the temperature change in the mixed layer that this fixed depth is driven by the net flux and then uh, dense, the denominator is density and specific heat and depth of the mixed layer. Um, because the ocean has high specific heat and um, high density that already starts to build in persistence. So once you uh, create an anomaly through this white noise forcing, it can help it stick around. So there's a kind of a the downside to it because there's a random forcing that you can't predict, but then also some that just from persistence, um, you get some predictability from that anomaly uh, slowly decaying in time. And you can see that a key variable also is the, is the mixed layer depth given by H here. Um, and so you can create what's called a stochastic model for sea surface temperature. And uh, here's an example basically using that equation before. So the top, um, the top panel shows kind of random uh, atmospheric variability, atmospheric forcing. And then the middle and lower panel shows what happens if you have uh, two different mixed layer depth. One is 50 meters and one is 500. Um, there's, and there's actually parts of the, the far north Atlantic that has 500 meter mixed layer depths in winter. And so you can see what if you have a moderately shallow mixed layer depth, you still get variability on, on monthly time scales. That's that middle middle plot. And then the bottom, you can see you get very low uh, long scale, long time scale variability, um, basically just from this process. So uh, it, this is sort of a, like a null hypothesis, but something we have to keep in mind, even when we're thinking for decadal time scale predictability. Um, the plot on the left shows the winter mixed layer depths. And so you can see the bright reds in the far north Atlantic. That's where you would have these very deep mixed layers. The, the ones along the northeast U.S. coast are um, are much shallower, uh, so you would it would be more like the the middle panel shown here. Okay, so um, the mixed layer is not fixed uh, with the seasonal cycle; it changes. Uh, so in winter, when you have strong wind forcing and buoyancy forcing and cooling at the surface, you create a, a deep mixed layer, and that's shown. Um, by that QNET prime going down into the ocean. And the blue colors there show the, the temperature of the water column, so it's well mixed. They're almost all the same. And the, um, the, the thin black line is the depths of the mixed layer. And then, then come summer, you heat up that mixed layer, and the, uh, the, the, it shoals quite a bit. It warms up at the surface. Those are the red colors. And then it, it deepens again. And so um, this process can lead to uh, what's called the winter to winter reemergence, where you create temperature anomalies of one side in that deep winter mixed layer. Uh, they maintain below the summer mixed layer in that seasonal thermocline, the green area in summer. 
and then come back in the following fall and winter. So uh, from an SST perspective, that can give us predict predictability from, from one winter to the next. Okay, and this is just uh, going through what I talked about, the different steps that, uh, how, these, how these form. Okay, so in, uh, in practice, um, uh, we've looked at it in uh, a number of different places, including the North Atlantic. And um, on, on the top left is the kind of two regions that it's, it, it's this reemergence is strong in, and the bottom shows an example. I believe we, we did this by EOF analysis, but sometimes you, we do it by correlation or regression. And you can see the, the kind of the deep red colors show the, the spread of anomalies down with depth and then uh, maintained across the, the summer at depth and then coming back up in the fall and fall and winter where the gray areas show that it's, it's not related to what, what happens there. Um, there's also a process called remote reemergence where these anomalies in winter are created in one location and then over the course of the, the falling um, summer and fall, those anomalies at depth get evicted. And in this case, the North Atlantic current carries them to this region, region two, where they reemerge. So that's that's the, where the remote comes from. Um, and jeez, uh, kind of stop the things. Okay. Sorry. Um, so one thing that is possible for coastal regions that hasn't really been looked at is so the mixed layers are deep in the in the Labrador Sea, and then could those get evicted down along the coast and then reemerge, come up in the off the northeast U.S. coast. So uh, here's kind of a repeat of the diagram uh, from before, except now imagine you're near the coast and the the bottom is is quite shallow. Let's say it's in this case, uh, maybe 110 meters. In, the, in this location, the mixed layer goes all the way down to the bottom. So um, the bottom senses uh, everything that happened through the column in winter, and then that would persist into uh, spring and summer. So this could give predictive skill for temperature anomalies and other, other variables at the, bottom, uh, at the bottom of the ocean, which is important for fisheries, say from from winter through the following uh, spring and summer. Okay, so we've kind of uh, had, a, had a local view uh, going for what happens at points, um, but the, the North Atlantic is influenced by large scale climate patterns. And what's shown here is the um, North Atlantic oscillation, the NAO. Um, so that's shown by the contours which show sea level pressure um, and so the, the NAO is comprised of a dipole with uh, pressure anomalies of one sign um, off kind of uh, Spain and the Azores uh, and the opposite sign in the North Atlantic over Greenland and, and Iceland. And so what's associated with this large scale uh, sea level pressure pattern is changes in winds shown by the vectors and that those changes in winds and, and temperatures can also drive the surface fluxes and that's shown on the, the right, the, the colors on the right. So the, the surface flux is associated with um, this NAO drive uh, warming uh, off the coast of North America and cooling in the, the North Atlantic. Um, and if you focus in on the, the left panel, you can see that there's a strong signal uh, off the Northeast US coast. Um, and some of that is due to surface fluxes and some of that is uh, could be more complicated due to like Ekman transport or, and also that the NEO can drive uh, dynamic changes in the ocean at well, as well that can influence um, ocean temperatures and, uh, and other variables in the, along the Northeast U.S. coast. So uh, combining those two, this shows that um, the pattern on the left is the leading pattern of SST variability, uh, and it's it's generally associated with the NAO that tripole pattern anomalies of uh, of the same sign in high latitudes in the subtropics and opposite sign um, uh, 
kind of off the, the coast of uh, the southeast US there, that blue color. And then on the right, you can see the autocorrelation of that pattern. And you can see it dips down and, and then jumps back up nine to 12 months later. And that's the, that's the signature of this reemergence, that the, that pattern is forced by the NAO. It can maintain below the surface in summer and then reemerge in the following uh, fall and winter. Okay, so a key, uh, key factor is how well are we going to be able to predict the NAO. Um, and I, the example is a, a made up example, um, you know, that this, how much of the variability can we predict? So we know that NAO is atmosphere only models can generate the NAO from internal atmospheric dynamics, and that's predictable, you know, maybe two weeks out. Um, and so that's the big blue part, that's the random part. Um, and then there's another a set other factors that people have investigated that come from other parts of the climate system that could give predictability. Um, so including ENSO um, and that should be stratosphere. So except not, there's no stratosphere. <laughs> and the, the problem of uh, doing, doing one of these late at night um, is, is exposed there. Um, so heat, 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 heat and other aspects in the North Atlantic Ocean and, and sea ice, and one might be able to think of other processes such as uh, tropical Atlantic SSTs. So uh, some studies have tried to look at how well we can, how well we can predict the, what the NAO does. Okay, so uh, shown on the upper left is a, a large ensemble from a global climate model, um, and the um, black line is the observed uh, winter NAO, and the red dots are individual members, um, basically started up in the no November before the DJF period. Um, there's 24 members uh, that are predicting what conditions are like that winter, and then the red line is the, the ensemble average of those, of those 24. So you can see that there's a large spread in the individual predictions, but the ensemble mean matches moderately closely uh, with uh, the observed black line. Um, and this process surprised people and um, is uh, because, called the signal to noise paradox because often what people would do is they take a from a prediction system one ensemble member and they would see how well the other ensemble members predicted it. And there that skill would be low as you can see by the large spread. But the ensemble mean uh, often seems to predict nature of the observations better um, than any individual one or the model actually predicting itself. So this has been called the paradox and um, I still believe that it hasn't, people maybe have hypotheses, but it hasn't been fully worked out. And then what's shown on the right are these potential mechanisms for why their skill um, Ranging from ENSO at the top, there is a modest ENSO signal in the, over the North Atlantic as the PNA pattern. It's far extension and extends over um, the, the eastern U.S. and the uh, uh, accompanying ocean. Um, the heat content in the, the Atlantic, um, Kara sea, sea ice, which is um, kind of north of uh, western Russia. That's where Kara Sea is. And uh, the QBO is a quasi biennial oscillation. It's a two-year oscillation in the tropical stratosphere, but teleconnections with it can also influence conditions over the North Atlantic. Um, so all these things seem to give some of the skill that they uh, reported in, in this study, although you also notice that uh, the left panel, which is the forecast, less, the left column is, is weaker than the right one. So the, the signal is, 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 is weaker in the ensemble mean compared to the, compared to nature. <coughs> okay, so we'll move on to, uh, to dynamical processes. Um, you know, the North Atlantic is a complex place. Um, the, the red is the surface currents on the far left. So you see the subtropical gyre in the North Atlantic and the Gulf Stream uh, which is part of that, and then extending further north in the North Atlantic, and then the blue curves are um, the currents, the return currents at, at depth. Um, 
And you can see that as we move close uh, to the left, uh, that that's the current systems uh, off the northeast coast. Um, so this Labrador current, the, the black lines um, coming down the Labrador Sea and, and hugging the coast uh, all the way down to um, like North Carolina. And then the, the white arrow is the kind of the, the north wall of the Gulf Stream. Um, and then what happens on the coast are influenced by both of those processes. And the far left shows the Gulf of Maine and its very complex bathymetry. So these large scale processes then, you know, how do they influence these uh, smaller scale features? And obviously that's, that's critical for, um, for the chemistry and biology. Okay, here, so here's just a map of um, what a typical SST field might look at. And you can see the clear indication of the northern edge of the Gulf Stream by the you know, the, how far the reds extend north and, you know, eddies can shed off, off the Gulf Stream and move to the coast. Um, and, and also there's, there's a complex, uh, you know, current system and, and structure for the, the thermocline in that region. So um, Mike mentioned this uh, in his talk briefly. There are uh, Rossby waves that are generated by processes in the uh, the, the Atlantic, they can be forced by the NAO, um, but they, they can be generated mainly by wind stress curl, buoyancy forcing, and flow over topography. Um, they tend to move uh, faster at lower latitudes, as, as, as given by theory. Um, so the, the far right is at 25 north, the one on the far left, left is at 45 north. Um, you can see that most of the variability is in sea surface height, which is what this is showing, is, is near the coast. Um, so some comes from this Rossby waves, but some is some of this sea surface height variability is, is driven by um, local processes. So the, the Rossby waves uh, initiate uh, uh, changes in the, the circulation. It's an adjustment process. So um, they can be part of where the Gulf Stream moves from uh, time and time, and clearly the, the Gulf Stream water can uh, penetrate to the shelf either by shedding eddies or coming in at, at depth. And this is a, a plot of just this the difference in temperature between two periods, uh, 2009 through 2018 and 2001 through 2012. So you can see that there's a huge warming along the coast with this shift in the in the, the Gulf Stream, and then it's the question is, you know, can we predict this in, in what time scales? And this, this kind of shift in the Gulf Stream was used to develop a uh, prediction system for uh, Silver Hague. Um, and so they uh, developed a autoregressive statistical model for predicting um, where Silver Hague would be their location based on the location in the northern uh, part of the Gulf Stream. And uh, the study found significant skill, even, even out to five-year timescales, based on this uh, change in the, where the Gulf Stream was. Oops. So now kind of moving up to the, um, the largest and, and sort of lowest frequency is the um, it's called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, the MAO. Sometimes people call it the MAV or for multidecadal variability. Um, it's centered in the North Atlantic. So it's basically the index that people have developed are based on the, the full uh, North Atlantic sea surface temperature and how that varies with time. And that time series of it is shown on the bottom. And so there's issues with how do you subtract out the climate change signal from that and it affects it. And so, so different people have come up with different methods, but they, the, the, the time series generally looks like what you see to the left there. So um, basically the people have been starting to examine how well we can predict this. Um, there are uh, the first and probably still the dominant hypothesis and change in the Atlantic Vernal overturning circulation, AMOC. Uh, um, there's also some studies to suggest that it could also be forced by thermal 
air sea fluxes and even changes in aerosols. So that aerosols were more prevalent over the United States during heavy industry and those, those have decreased more recently. So what's shown on the, the bottom right is uh, uh, what comes out of a GFTL sphere prediction system. And so uh, the, the blue line shows the model prediction of AMOC and the, the red line shows the, um, the, the skill, uh, the red line, I'm sorry, shows the rapid array, which is instruments across 26 north. So even though it's a short record, you can see that the, the model matches well with uh, what the predictions are there. Okay, just on the longest time scale, there's um, this is a, a regional downscaling of um, a, a climate change using uh, ROMs, a seven kilometer version along the uh, US East Coast, and um, from forced by three different uh, global climate models. Um, so this is kind of getting out on centennial timescales. How well can we project what will happen in the future? Um, so you can see that the models all show warming, but the, they vary in terms of the strength of the warming along the northeast shelf. Um, and also the, the Gulf Stream sh slows up. And so that change in the Gulf Stream speed influences the temperatures off offshore. Um, and that's why there's those wider areas where the less heat is being brought north by the, the Gulf Stream um, as it slows going out in the future. Okay, so um, we've kind of stepped through the, um, the different processes that, that, that are potential for um, uh, making predictions. Um, I think there, some of the things to consider is that how do we go from these sort of large scale forecasts that people have looked at to, you know, close into the shore. Um, anomaly correlations kind of hide some of the things that people might really care about. So is that a good, is that a good measure? Um, there's also, it's difficult to separate the force signal coming from climate change from when we initialize and make a forecast. Um, so as we go forward, those are, those are things we, we need to consider. So I'll stop there, thank you. Okay, so we have a couple minutes for questions. Art? So at a workshop, I think, I think it was in Friday Harbor about 10 or 15 years ago, there was some hands there <laughs> associated with the idea that salinity anomalies that form in the Labrador could infect southward along the coast in uh, the Labrador current and on a long multi year time scale affect stratification probably in places like the Gulf of Maine, if I remember correctly, off the, off the northeast uh, uh, North American continent. And with that, that limited uh, observational database, low degrees of freedom, it seemed to correlate with. Things like krill and I think it was whales, or um, maybe it was seabirds, I think, or maybe you know, the whole ecological response that seemed to be associated with that. Everybody was really excited about it. Now, 10 or 15 years have passed. Does that anybody know if that kind of still works? Did it come to fruition? I think you might have been at that, that meeting, like, were, were you? On Friday Harbor? Yeah, maybe I was. <laughs> but your memory is better than mine, I guess. <laughs> well, it, was, you know, it was like an amazing, apparently, thing. I, don't, I was a little suspicious because it was really just a couple of bumps on the cable time scale. So. Yeah, I guess there's two things. One is, um, you know, if you have short time records, right, then you, you have to be careful of if things, and low frequency, especially if things line up. Um, I think people have found evidence for uh, sinking in the Labrador Sea and how, and then tracking those anomalies as they move south at, at depth. And then I guess there's a question of, that is depth like 2,000 meters, and then does that still make it onto the, the continental shelf, which is where we would care about for species. I guess the other thing for pelagics that if you're changing the, you know, over time the, the, 
the, the whole circulation. So like the position of the bell string shifts as, as part of that. And then those species care about where the, the gradients are. So they're looking for gradients where the food are in the open ocean. Um, that could be another possibility. Thank you. Um, great summary. Uh, it's a really interesting thinking about East Coast things because INSO is not the main driver of scale the forecasts. Um, and I'm just wondering, on seasonal time scale, what of the mechanisms that you outlined there, what is driving most of the scale or about on seasonal time scales? Or is there sort of a hodgepodge of mechanisms that give you give you better scale? Yeah, so that, that I, I haven't shown like the, the North American multimodal ensemble prediction for especially the Northeast U.S. is abysmal, as it now stands. <laughs> Other than persistence, there's there's not there's not much. So then there's a question of um, is that because the you know, the resolution or we're not? It's hard to initialize a model to get a mock right or you know that's critical density structure and how do, how do you get that? Um, so I guess the hope would be that you, you, there would be these other processes that each would give you, you know, some fraction that you could explain. You know, and so it's much weaker than the Pacific. There's still a little bit, you know, tropical Atlantic teleconnections, um, maybe some of the Rossby wave propagation, you know, perhaps other things one can think of. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker one more time. Okay, our, our next speaker was going to be uh, Mitch Bushak, uh, but um, Charlie Stock uh, is going to give the talk on his behalf, both from GFDL, um, on the Arctic and Bering Sea. So the timer is, time's entire period, so basically we'll get to 15, that's under five minutes, I'll try to get to it. Yeah, this is going to kind of be a hybrid talk. I'm going to introduce it, and then this recorded talk. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank God for that. Right? Okay. <laughs> so, I'll let you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Great. 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 So, um, so as Matt said, I'm not Mitch. Um, I can do my best to do this in a Canadian accent, but that would go poorly. Uh, Mitch is, re sends his regrets. He uh, he would have loved to be here. Was really looking forward to engaging with this uh, community. He's been working on patterns of regional sea ice <coughs> prediction skill throughout the Arctic and the Southern Ocean, actually as well. Um, and uh, but he's thankfully sent a, uh, a recording of a nice talk that he gave, looking at re patterns of regional sea ice predictability. I'm going to introduce a few kind of lead-in slides, and then we're going to start that recording and let Mitch really tell you the the good stuff about sea ice. Because for those of you who don't know me, I'm, a, I'm an ocean biology chemist primarily, so it's probably a good thing I'm not giving this entire time. Um, so um, Mitch starts just by pointing out that, that, that the relatively rapid decline in Arctic sea ice has, has generated a lot of um, impetus to, uh, to understand how predictable the sea ice is, not just for these declines, but also for the large excursions around those declines. You know, growing applications for navigation, uh, for ecology, and uh, in a number of other areas are, are, are driving a lot of activity in this area <coughs> recently. And, and I think Mitch is optimistic that, that there's some, some nice applications in the ecological, eco ecological forecasting realm. Um, he raises a few examples here, um, looking at fisheries with Bering Sea Pollock and Cod. And I know a couple of people, I think, are online who have been working on this, Al Herman and others. Uh, where sea ice is, seems to be playing a strong role for a number of fisheries in, in, in the Bering, and those are very productive and important fisheries nationally. Of course, there's strong effects on, on uh, spring blooms and, and, and ecological systems through its control of, uh, of light and mixing, and, um, and also strong controls on, on habitat. And so what, what Mitch will talk about now is, you know, we can break down the Arctic into, into a wide variety of systems. And several of these are, are in our purview of, of U.S. coastal waters here, the Chukchi, uh, uh, the Bering, the Beaufort Sea. Uh, and then as you look across these, each will have slightly different mechanisms that control their, their prediction skill. 
uh, some for summer sea ice, some for winter sea ice. And, and Mitch will kind of walk you through these in his recorded talk. And so I think without further ado, we can, we can switch to that recorded talk. And, and uh, he's got a link here. Or I don't know if someone's going to come up. I, I will screw this up if it's possible, so I'll wait. Um, and again, uh, uh, Mitch really sends his regrets. And, um, and if, you, if you're drawn to anything in this talk, I think he's put his email address at the end. Please do reach out to Mitch, a uh, very friendly guy. He would love to talk sea ice and ecological forecasting with you. this work is the observed decline of Arctic sea ice extent. Hello, virtual listeners. Thanks a lot for taking the time to tune into this talk. Um, my name is Mitch Bushick, and I'm a research scientist at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And today I'll be speaking about mechanisms of regional Arctic sea ice predictability in two dynamical seasonal forecast systems. Many people have contributed to this work, and I want to say a big thanks to all of my co-authors whose names are listed here. So the primary motivation for this work is the observed decline of Arctic sea ice extent and the corresponding need for skillful predictions of Arctic sea ice on the sub-seasonal to seasonal to interannual timescale. And so we have three main research questions we're attempting to address today. Firstly, how skillful are current regional predictions of Arctic sea ice? Secondly, what are the key sources of regional sea ice predictability? And third, how do we go about improving sea ice predictions? To address these questions, we're going to use results from two dynamical seasonal prediction systems that were developed at GFDL, the FLOR and SPEAR medium system. FLOR stands for Forecast Oriented Low Ocean Resolution, and SPEAR is the recently developed Seamless System for Prediction and Earth System Research. You'll see that both of these models are fully coupled dynamical global models consisting of atmosphere, land, ocean, and sea ice components. 
They have the same nominal resolution of half degree in the atmosphere and land components and use a coarser one degree, one degree resolution in the ocean and sea ice components. Both systems are initialized using a variety of different oceanic and atmospheric observations. Um, so in both systems, we assimilate satellite sea surface temperatures, ocean temperature and salinity profiles coming from sources such as Argo floats and XBTs. And we do that at daily time frequency. In the atmosphere, we assimilate three-dimensional temperature data from NSEP2 reanalysis at six hourly frequency in the floor system. And in spear medium, we assimilate three-dimensional temperature, winds, and humidity data from CFSR. Now, neither system assimilates sea ice data directly, but we, but we do incorporate a sea ice concentration data constraint in the spear medium system in that we use the sea ice concentration observations to adjust the under ice sea surface temperature values. And so you can think of this as a very simplistic way of doing sea ice data assimilation. Um, in terms of data assimilation methods, we use the ensemble Kalman filter in both systems, and SPEAR has an additional nudged atmosphere and SST run, which is used to initialize the sea ice, atmosphere, and land components. And then using these systems, we've ran suites of retrospective seasonal predictions. So these are ensemble forecasts initialized on the first of each month and then run for one year of time. And we've done this for the time period spanning 1992 to 2020, which gives us a nice 29 year record to assess the skill of these predictions against observations. So now we can move on to our first science question, which is do floor and spear have sea ice extent prediction skill? As a first look at that, here I'm showing our predictions of Pan-Arctic September sea ice extent. The observed time series is shown in black here, and the predictions made at various lead times, ranging from lead zero, which are September 1st initialized forecasts, back to lead three, which are June 1st initialized forecasts, are shown in the colored curves. What we see is that both systems have some skill at capturing the observed time series, and we can quantify the skill using the ACC, or anomaly correlation coefficient, and we see values around 0.8 or 0.9 in both systems. Now, clearly some of this skill is coming from the ability to capture the downward trend in sea ice. And so a more stringent test is to first detrend both time series and then compute a, a, an ACC of the detrended anomalies. And you can see that both systems also have skill for those detrended anomalies. And the skill tends to be higher in the SPEAR system. Okay, so now we're gonna to move to the regional scale. And we're going to do that by taking the Arctic and breaking it up into these 14 different regions of sea ice variability, and then asking the question, can these systems skillfully predict sea ice extent anomalies in each of these 14 regions? I'll start off with two regions of summer sea ice variability, the Laptev Sea and the East Siberian Sea. What I'm plotting here are detrended anomaly correlation coefficient values for different target months. These are the months that we're trying to predict along the x-axis and then different forecast lead times, going from zero to 11 months along the y-axis. Anywhere you see a square on these plots indicates that the skill of the system is exceeding that of a basic anomaly persistence forecast. And anywhere you see a dot on the plot indicates that the skill is significant, but it's lower than persistence. The third column shows the difference between the two systems, spear minus floor. Um, anywhere you see, an, see, you see an upward triangle indicates that the skill of the spear system is higher than that of floor and anywhere you see a downward triangle indicates the opposite. So we generally see that SPEAR is providing a, a notable improvement um, in terms of skill relative to the earlier floor system. And that improvement is seen in these regions, especially at lead times of zero to three months. We also see that in, in both the Laptev and East Siberian Sea, the skill structures tend to have this diagonal correlation structure to them, which is indicative of the spring predictability barrier, which exists for Arctic sea ice. Now, the next question we want to address is what are the key sources of predictability for summer sea ice extent in these systems? And so here I'm showing the um, detrended anomaly correlation coefficient values for September sea ice extent in the two systems in the Laptev and East Siberian seas. And what we're going to attempt to do here is reconstruct this skill using a combination of very simple linear regression based prediction models. Um, we, we tried a number of different predictors, and we ultimately found that a combination of regional sea ice extent and regional sea ice volume was able to reproduce essentially all of the skill that we were finding in the dynamical models. 
These predictors are based on the initial conditions that each system used for its forecasts. So here in black, I'm showing the skill of the regional sea ice extent based predictor. And we can see that at short lead times, we can explain most of the skill of the dynamical model based on sea ice extent persistence, but at longer lead times, the sea ice extent pr pr uh, predictor does not do as well. And it's sea ice volume that comes in and provides the dominant source of predictability at lead times of two and three months. So what we're seeing here is that there's a combination of two predictability sources, sea ice extent at short lead times and sea ice volume at longer lead times, which can explain essentially all of the skill of the dynamical models in these regions. And we also see that we can explain the skill differences between spear medium and floor via these linear regression based models in that we can see that spears sea ice extent based prediction is much more skillful than floors ind indicative of improved sea ice extent initial conditions in the system. And we can also see that spears sea ice volume based prediction is also much more skillful than floors indicative of improved sea ice thickness initial conditions in this system. So the paper contains a more comprehensive analysis of other regions of summer sea ice variability. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to some regions of winter sea ice variability here and focus in on the, the Barents Sea and the Labrador Sea. The first thing you'll notice is that these winter sea ice predictions are much more skillful than what we were seeing for summer sea ice. And we think the reason for that is that winter sea ice is simply um, more predictable inherently. And that's due to its strong coupling with the oceanic conditions in the subpolar seas and the fact that those oceanic conditions are themselves fundamentally predictable. Again, we see that the spear medium system is, is generally providing improvements relative to floor at short lead times. And in the Barents Sea at longer lead times, there's um, not much difference in skill between the two systems. In the Labrador Sea, we see that the spear system is providing an improvement in terms of its predictions of winter and spring sea ice extent conditions. And then one thing to note here is that you see a mix of squares and dots on these plots, which indicates that while these systems do often have they skill at longer lead times, the skill of the system is actually losing to that of a basic persistence forecast. So this yeah, suggests that there's a lot of room for improvement still in these systems. Did you hear me giving a talk? So now we can play the same game we played before and ask the question, what are the key sources of predictability for winter sea ice extent in these systems? So here the blue curves show detrended anomaly correlation coefficient values in the Barents and Labrador seas. And again, we're going to construct a series of linear regression based predictors in order to attempt to explain the skill of the dynamical models. The black line here shows the skill of the sea ice extent based predictor. And we can see that sea ice extent does a very good job of explaining the skill of the dynamical model at short lead times. Um, it doesn't do as well at intermediate lead times. And then interestingly, at long lead times, we can see that the extent based predictor is actually beating that of the dynamical model which is what we saw in the previous slide, where we were actually losing to the persistence forecast in some of these long lead prediction cases. We find that a second predictor based on the upper ocean heat content averaged over the upper 200 meters of the ocean does a very good job at sort of filling in the skill over these intervening summer months. And so what this shows us is that this combination of sea ice extent based persistence combined with upper ocean heat content based persistence is able to provide quite a skillful prediction of sea ice extent in these regions. And the combination of these predictors, interestingly, is able to generally beat the skill of the dynamical models, which suggests that there's quite a bit of room for improvement in these systems in order to catch up to the skill of these simple linear regression models. Okay, so the, the final region I want to highlight is our prediction skill for the Chukchi Sea. And, and what we see in both systems is that there's an interesting skill structure in the Chukchi Sea, where we see relatively low skill in August, September, and October, but then those months are flanked by higher skill values in November, July, and June. So in, in order to explain this interesting skill structure, we can again turn to an analysis of the sources of sea ice extent prediction skill in this region. And again, I'm gonna consider the three predictors based on sea ice extent, sea ice volume, and upper ocean heat content. In the months of June and July, we see that the ocean heat content based predictor shown in magenta here does a very good job of recon reconstructing essentially all of the model's skill. So this result suggests that the key source of predictability in June and July is coming from the ocean. Now, as we, mo as we move into August, September, and October, you can see that the 
Interestingly, the skill of that ocean heat content based predictor crashes down to a value very close to zero. And that's the case in both floor and spear medium. And the skill is low in August, low in September, and it bounces up a bit in October, but it's still fairly low. And what we see is that over these months, it's the sea ice volume based predictor that jumps up and provides more skill in this region. And so in, in these months, it seems to be, again, the combination of sea ice extent in black and sea ice volume in red that's providing the dominant sources of predictability. So we're back into more of an ice thickness based predictability regime over these months surrounding the summer minimum sea ice extent. And then finally, in November, we see that the ocean heat content predictor um, jumps up rather abruptly and provides skill all the way back to 11 months in advance. So it seems that in November, we're again returning back to this ocean based predictability regime. And now the natural question is, why is there this trade off that occurs between ocean based and thickness based predictability regimes? So to get at that question in colors here, I'm plotting the um, the ocean surface current speeds from the spear medium initial conditions. And what we see is that there's an inflow of ocean waters through the Bering Strait. The inflow um, travels partially eastward along the coast of Alaska, forming the Alaskan coastal current, and it splits into a second branch that flows westward towards Wrangell Island. Now the gray curves on here show the observed position of the sea ice edge in different months of the year. And what we find is that in the months of June and July, the sea ice edge is positioned such that it, it interacts directly with those warm inflowing ocean waters from the Bering Strait. And as such, the ocean is able to impart in a direct influence onto the sea ice. In the months of August, September and October, the ice edge has retreated sufficiently far northward that the ocean waters come in, curve to the right, and they um, are not able to actually interact with the sea ice edge. And then finally in November, the ice edge grows southward and the ocean waters are again able to interact with the sea ice and impart predictability onto it. So it's this combination between the geometry of the inflow and then the position of the sea ice edge in different months of the year that determines the sea ice predictability. So just to wrap up, we've shown that spear and floor can both skillfully predict Pan-Arctic and regional sea ice extent two to 11 months in advance, depending on the region and the season of interest. We've found that the spear skill is generally higher than floors due to improved sea ice extent and sea ice volume initial conditions. And we found that a combination of regional predictors coming from sea ice extent, sea ice volume, and upper ocean heat content can match, or in some cases exceed, the skill of the dynamical models. And we therefore advocate using these three simple statistical predictors as benchmark tests for evaluating Arctic seasonal prediction systems. And finally, we found that the Chuck GC exhibited this interesting combined predictability regime associated with interactions between the sea ice edge position and inflowing ocean waters through Bering Strait. So thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Q&A session. If you're interested in more details of this study, the, the paper was recently published in Journal of Climate as an early on, online release, and the reference is there. Great, so we'll see you all in a few weeks. Um, you're on, I guess. Can you, can you hear me? Well, we just tested a share screen. Okay.
okay, I have to share your screen. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. So I think you can just share your screen. And you should be okay. Able. Give me one second. Um, Here's my screen. Okay, let me share um, this one. Okay, yeah, oh. try to go into presentation mode. Let's see. How's that? No, that's not the one. Oh, uh, you guys switch screens. That we're seeing your presentation mode. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, Should mention to everybody in the room that uh, Mike J. Cox apologized by the way, but he's got little kids and it's 5 a.m. there. So they were wondering why daddy was talking. Okay, you're, you're, you're good. Okay, so you can see my screen now, right? Yes. Okay, wonderful. In the presentation mode? <laughs> wonderful, okay. Well, thanks, Matt, for the introduction. And, and also thanks for the organizing committee for the uh, opportunity to me to uh, speak at this meeting. I'm sorry for not being able to join you guys uh, in person. Yeah. So I am um, a physical oceanographer by, by training. Over the years, I had um, uh, the pleasure to work with uh, many colleagues on the coupling <coughs> and biogeochemistry. So I want to start my presentation by acknowledging uh, my colleagues and post on students and, and also the funding agency. Special thanks goes to the uh, the people, uh, their names highlighted in bold, um, who contribute the results uh, in this uh, in this presentation. So the outline of my talk is I'm going to give um, uh, a co a quick review about um, ecological forecasting work being done in the Gulf of Mexico and um, U.S. Southeast, and then just like other uh, speakers, I'm going to focus on focusing more on uh, a key drivers, physical drivers including the Gulf Stream, uh, I'm sorry, including the storm, uh, the loop current, the Gulf Streams. And, and then I will share a few ideas about uh, where some of the new research can be focused on, followed by a summary uh, in the end. So in the last 10 years, there, there are many work being done on the coupling, uh, coupled physical biogeochemical models uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, South Atlantic Bay. And here are are uh, five different uh, examples. So all the studies uh, were published in the last 10 years also, and uh, they focus on the uh, phytoplankton dynamics, look into the broader seasonal biogeochemical variabilities and the nutrient limitations on the phytoplankton dynamics and also the seasonalities in the biogeographic. And uh, a new study focused on the uh, site structure zooplankton community dynamics. And um, all these studies couple ocean circulation models with uh, BGC models that have a different uh, level of complexities. For example, the uh, year at all 2013 coupled a regional circulation model uh, based on the ROMs with a final type uh, BGC model. And um, this model is considered both the nitrogen cycles and also the carbon cycles. And showing here is a uh, animation highlighting the month by month comparison of the model simulated and the MODI satellite observed uh, satellite sea surface quality. I'm so sorry, home phone number, great. Uh, cloud view uh, comparison. So they show a, a quite reasonable agreement. And, and this is a, a new study published by uh, Shelfair uh, in 2020. In this case, they reported a regional modeling study that couples um, a high based the Gulf of Mexico model with an 11 component uh, numeral models. And the simulation was run for 10, 20 years. Uh, in this case, uh, they're looking to a very detailed day by day variations of um, 11 different state variables in the uh, by, uh, BGC modeling system. What's really neat about this study is um, 
the study did a very extensive comparison with um, in situ data such as CMAP, zooplankton observations uh, with a model. So they're looking into the mesoscale, uh, meso zooplankton biomass comparison. So this is a, a climatological view. So this is an observation taken from all the last uh, 20 years compared with the model mean solu uh, solutions for the meso zooplankton. They're, they're also using the model solutions to analyze the size structure zooplankton community dynamics over different time scales, looking to, for example, uh, annual mean and some snapshots on particular days in the winter season and summer season. And they can differentiate the large zooplankton uh, and uh, the predator zooplankton, for instance. So, so in my opinion, I think it is fair to see that um, <clears throat> there are many good work and uh, lots of progress that have been made over the last 10 years also uh, in developing BGC models and marine ecological models uh, that have encouraging synoptic to seasonal time scales and also mesoscale. And uh, the, predict the predictability <clears throat> of the marine ecosystem and the marine resource are really dependent upon how well we can understand and predict their physical drivers. So I'd like to move into the first key physical drivers in this region, in the Southeast US and Gulf of Mexico, which is um, uh, storms, especially the tropical storms. So this is a map showing the, um, <clears throat> the storms happened between 2003 to 2020. So over 18 years. So we're looking at um, uh, 321 storms. Uh, with different intensity varying from the tropical depression all the way to category five storms. So 80% uh, of these storms ended up uh, making either making landfall or moving through the Gulf of Mexico or Southeast US. So they have a tremendous impact on the um, regional circulations and also ecological uh, processes. And idealized modeling study, uh, actually two of them highlights some um, the so-called right right hand side bias in sea surface temperature cooling the phytoplankton blooms as well as a, a dic uh, concentrations um, the rc pco2 fluxes so such uh, right hand bias <clears throat> in the northern hemisphere <clears throat> they're they're associated with uh, right right side uh, asymm asymmetric uh, mixing due to inertial oscillations but also due to the restructurations from the strong uh, recirculation cells um, on the right hand side. So this is a really uh, interesting mesoscale, some mesoscale interaction that leads to such a um, uh, asymmetric uh, pattern <coughs> in the physical state and also the BGC state. And, and our recent study uh, looking into the relationship between change of uh, temperature, the, the dissolved inorganic carbons, the nutrient uh, nitrate, and the chlorophyll and uh, the PCO2 water uh, changes before and after the passage of the storms with different um, hurricane intensity and also different uh, hurricane translation speed. So this is again an idealized modeling study and each dot here circle here represents a sensitivity model experiments. And then there are 20 different sensitiv sensitivity model experiments. And then uh, one can do a polynomial uh, model fitting to highlight the relationship and the, um, the changes in the surface ocean property with the combinations of hurricane intensity and uh, translation speed. So what we are seeing here, very interestingly, is um, there's a quasi uh, linear relationship <clears throat> in change of temperature, the DIC and nitrate. So um, the maximum decrease of temperature, for instance, happens when you have a, a category five storm uh, that moving very slowly at two meters per second. So during such case, you have a coldest temperature cooling, you have a largest uh, DIC at the surface, as well as uh, most nutrient nitrate coming from the deep ocean to the surface. The chlorophyll response is actually quite different. So we, we are seeing this bimodal structure. In this case, um, <clears throat> the largest chlorophyll increase actually happens when there's a category five storms 
but moving at a higher speed, so about 5 to 5.5 meters per second. So during such combination, we actually see the largest chlorophyll um, increase at the surface. Now, if you look at the carbon, so this is a PCO to water, we actually see a sandal pattern. So this is most complex nonlinear pattern. And in, in this case, um, we're looking at um, essentially the interplay among the chemical processes, in this case, the temperature dependent solubility, the physical transport, the upwelling of the DIC coming from the ocean, uh, deep ocean, as well as um, uh, the biological consumption. So phytoplankton will uptake certain uh, carbons from the water. So that's why the, the largest uh, PCO2 change uh, happens um, at uh, strong hurricanes, so between category four and five, and also mid speed between five to eight meters per second. So underlying conclusion here really highlights that um, we need to consider all the synoptic storm-induced physical biogeochemical interactions in order to better quantify ocean, ocean's role in a climate um, system. And um, you know, many climate models that doesn't resolve such small-scale high-frequency variability might underestimate the storms and also ocean roles um, as, as um, like carbon sink. And here's another example looking to a more realistic modeling study of ocean physical and the BGC response to Hurricane uh, Ike. So this is uh, in September 2008. And we are looking at uh, sea level pressure, sea surface temperature, DIC, and air sea uh, PCO2 fluxes. And we are looking at uh, four days snapshot moving from September 9th to 12th. So you see that the storm is translation, translating through the Gulf and the low pressure system indicates the location of the hurricane center. This is corresponding sea surface temperature variation, very strong right-hand code bias. And you also see an enhancement of the surface on DIC. And in this case, we're looking at a very strong uh, outgassing. So the, the ocean uh, DIC and PCO2 here and essentially resupplied back into the atmosphere. And this is a huge um, synoptic variability. Again, um, when we look into the predictabilities of ocean circulation and ecological processes, we really need to have a good um, uh, synoptic weather forecast. Uh, in, this, in this case, we need to have a good uh, hurricane track, hurricane translation speed, and also hurricane intensity uh, forecast. So let me move on to the, the next um, key processes, which is a loop current. So there's a National Academy study report back in 2018 shows that the position, the strength, and the structure of the loop current system has a major implications of arc intensity, marine ecosystem, oil and gas operation, fishery industry, tourism, and the Gulf regional economy. So, so in this case, um, you know, we can utilize a 20 plus years of this height. And, uh, uh, a, a methodology called self-organizing map to, to essentially highlight a different mode of loop current. So because loop current uh, is associated with a high sea level and also higher sea surface temperature, so you can use sea surface height as indications of the position and also the boundary of the loop current. So over 20 plus years, we see that the 50, 50, about 52% are so-called normal pattern and then there's about 20, 29% uh, you're having so-called um, extension uh, mode. And then about 30% having this uh, retraction and eddy separation mode. So understanding the eddy separations and the retraction, uh, they have a very uh, important implications on the Gulf-wide scale ecosystem ecological processes. So if you look at them, uh, there's a third mode retraction and separation, and there a long-term uh, variability in terms of the frequency of occurrence of this P3. And you can group them into the month-by-month -month time series, and uh, the long-term monthly mean showing by the, um, the green dot, green circle line here indicates that there's a pretty interesting uh, seasonal cycle, right? So you tend to have more P3 patterns in the, in the fall season 
and the last P3 retraction and separation mode in the spring season. And such variability is uh, very closely related to the wind stress curve, uh, especially the wind stress curve in the Caribbean Sea. And you also have some connections with the wind stress curve in the Bahamas and as well as the Gulf of Mexico. But the largest correlation uh, is found between the um, uh, between the, um, the variability of the P3 and the Caribbean uh, Sea wind stress. Now, if you look at um, uh, the entire 30 plus years time series, we also see a correlations between the uh, pattern three annual mean occurrence with uh, the ENSO index. So uh, the ENSO index is highlighted by the green line here and um, the uh, PO uh, P3 FO is high by the green line. In this case, uh, with a 90 days lag, we actually have a, about 0.6 correlation coefficient. So uh, this is, um, again, the color connection, and um, there's uh, some weak seasonal cycle that can track to the large scale patterns. But if you look at the um, year by year variations, especially over a shorter time scale, like months by months, we find the system is actually very difficult uh, to predict. So this is one example for so-called loop current hyperactivities, which happened in 2014 and 15. So we're looking at um, uh, about um, uh, 10 months, loop current, loop current eddy separation dynamics. In this case, um, this, this is all the in-situ measurements coming from the drifter data. And uh, we see there's an eddy separation, there's a there's a reattachment, and then there's expansion, there's a re-separation, and then moving into early 2015, there's another re separation, another reattachment. So this is so-called forecasting nightmare. And a lot of such variability is driven by the internal nonlinear dynamics, which is um, still very extremely challenged to predict. And um, it's associated physical and bi biological uh, implications and forecasting also become uh, very challenging as well. And um, this is a, a model simulation at one kilometers. And um, the point here is uh, there's tremendous amount of mesoscale variabilities. Uh, in this case, we know that um, uh, high the high resolution circulation, they, they inference the circulation, the BGC processes not only from the, the transport perspective, uh, but, but they can also generate variations uh, in the environment that can affect uh, the biological and chemical rates. So predictions of the circulation and the BGC at some massive scale also remain a major challenge. So the third major uh, physical drivers here is uh, the Gulf Dreams, especially on the southeast coast of US. In this case, um, there's a classical paper by Tom Lee, like in 1990, uh, 1991, showing that uh, the frontal eddies associated uh, with the Gulf Dream can introduce a strong shelf break up uh, In this case, the deep and cold uh, uh, nutrient rich water come to the shelf and then can simulate, uh, can stimulate uh, uh, significant uh, phytoplankton and uh, zooplankton blooms. And another major behavior of the Gulf Dream is actually the larger scale meanders. Because we actually can use remote sensing observations to monitor how how far away the Gulf Dream is. So uh, uh, in this case, you can look at the 20 years sea surface height uh, measurements. And the color shading indicates the mean sea level uh, is very high. And identify the mean location of the Gulf Stream. The dash line here is a one standard deviation. And then the sign line here is envelope of the Gulf Stream over the 20 plus years. And then you can track the offshore distance along each of the cross shell uh, trajectories. One of the interesting features is um, there's a major offshore meander of the Gulf Stream that happens about four months. Uh, between end of 2009 and uh, early 2010. So the Gulf Stream, for whatever reason, decided to shift the further offshore as far as um, about 100 kilometers offshore. So this has a major ecological implications. And in this case, um, one can utilize a couple of physical BTC models 
to simulate the consequences of the Gulf Chain large offshore meander. In this case, you can look at the, the long-term mean climatology of the cross shelf temperature and nitrate along this transect and look into the January 2010 uh, temperature and uh, nitrate. And then look at, look at their difference, right? In this case, uh, because of the large offshore meander and uh, the conservations of the volume required a subsurface onshore flow which transport deep ocean nutrient, uh, high nutrient content, uh, and also cold water, which uh, reduce, um, produce a very strong temperature cooling anomaly and also high nutrient anomaly. And, and then looking at a, a shelf-wide response, you can see that uh, the difference between January 2010 and the long-term climatology, you, you have this very large scale uh, shelf water uh, cooling anomaly, especially along the shelf break. You also have a higher nutrient content in January 2010, uh, the high chlorophyll as well as high DIC. And this shelf-wide response is really closely related to the Gulf Stream uh, larger scale. So some of the key predict uh, predictability questions uh, I think we should um, um, study as a community include uh, uh, number one, are the loop current eddy separations and Gulf G meanders predictable? And uh, how are the, the separations and the meander affected by the wind and other larger scale ARC processes? And what are the variabilities on the daily to decadal time scales and how the separations and meander initiate it? And uh, there's, there's also interesting questions on how do the multi-scale physical and BGC process interacts. Interacts. In this case, I think uh, there's a strong implication that submaster scale processes needs to be fully understood and predicted. And I think one of the major challenge for all the models is um, to uh, how well can they reproduce the timing, the strength, and also the duration of the separations and the meander. And, and, and finally, there are associated uh, biogeochemical variabilities. Um, there's a number of ways I think we can we can work on to improve our understandings and uh, finding the solutions for the questions in the previous slides. Uh, the first the first one is to generate long term decadal scale ocean reanalysis. I think uh, several speakers in this session already mentioned that. Uh, one key is we need to have a data simulation uh, to keep the model on track over such a longer term uh, simulation. We also need to develop uh, new uh, evaluations and uh, improvement in ocean forecasting methodology. I like to special, uh, especially uh, support the idea to you utilize the multi-model ensembles so we can do a careful intermodel comparison as well as uh, uncertainty quantifications. And finally, I think uh, we need a better job to integrate the models um, and data, I'm sorry, uh, integrate observations with the model. Uh, go beyond just do the model validation. Uh, I think model can do more, especially in terms of uh, performing observing system simulation policy <clears throat> to provide them um, some guidance for future sampling and observation programs. So uh, in that regards, um, my team, we recently finished a, um, a high resolution ocean reanalysis. So this is a ROMS based um, using ensemble data simulation approach so satellite observation, mooring data, the gliders and the, uh, and the drifter data, as well as um, HF radar surface velocities are being assimilated into this um, uh, 28 years reanalysis. So the solutions are at four kilometers with uh, 50 vertical layers. We have also done some um, initial uh, offline BGC model simulations based on this new ocean uh, reanalysis. So there are some um, encouraging results showing the um, at surface chlorophyll comparisons. So we'd love to, you know, working with colleagues who are interested in this new high resolution ocean reanalysis to uh, fully understand them, you know, look into different aspects of circulation and the ecological forecasting problems. So in summary, I think for this region in the Gulf and the Southeast the US, hurricane plays a major role uh, in the ecological forecasting. And uh, we do need to have a better hurricane forecast and also improved understanding about how hurricane interacts with uh, the ocean system. And um, the loop current is 
is a, a major driver and um, the separation is dependent upon uh, the internal nonlinear physics, but modulated and perturbed by the intranual variations of larger scale wind forcing. The Gulf Stream meander are a dominant process that can lead to the shelf void uh, ecosystem variabilities uh, in this region. So um, here's my uh, short answers to several Kaivar related questions. The first question is, um, are there larger scale sources of pre predictabilities for the Southeast and Gulf of Mexico? Uh, that could advance coastal circulation and, and the ecological forecasting. The answer is yes, I think, because um, there are some the inference from the larger scale wind field, NAO, and Atlantic <clears throat> oscillations, as uh, other speakers mentioned this morning. So the second question is, which ocean observations are most useful? <clears throat> I think it really depends on the process we are trying to study. And um, again, I want to emphasize that OSI observing system simulation experiments can be a very good way to quantify that. Finally, how can we uh, leverage the higher resolution coast ocean model with the global scale models or larger scale models? I think we need to uh, really examine both the downscaling and upscaling interactions. And this is where the coast model can contribute. And also the coast ocean model can, can be utilized to quantify the uh, multi-scale interactions, uh, especially between the mass scale and sub mass scale interactions. With that, I'd like to thank you so much for your attention. And uh, sorry again for not being able to um, join you in person. Uh, very, I'll be very happy to answer any uh, questions you might have. Thanks again. Okay, we have time for maybe one quick question because we're getting into the break. Thank you for that talk. That was excellent. Um, I'm Suzanne Craig, NASA Goddard. Um, I wonder if you could make a comment on how the PCO2 balance is affected by the passage of storms. And I ask this in the co context of a, um, a case study that myself and um, some of our students did where we saw that the passage of a, um, a strong storm on the ocean shelf um, actually produced a net uh, drawdown of CO2 comparable in amplitude to the spring bloom. Um, essentially what happened was the stratification was broken down, we had mixing up into the upper next pairs and a lot of nutrients. Uh, and I'm wondering with your more extensive analysis compared to our fairly limited analysis, could you comment on how um, those types of storm-induced um, processes uh, related to PCO2 can of work um, in terms of the, the balance or the, or, or the, the annual net flux of CO2 uh, in between the ocean and the atmosphere? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, great question. Um, I, I think, um, as we can see from this slide, the, the PCO2 re reaction or response to the storm is actually the most complex and have a different phases. I would say initially, especially right after the storm passage, you will have a very strong outgassing, right? And this is largely a physical driven. So there's upwelling, bring more DIC up to the surface and stronger mixing and higher wind speed all of them helps the, uh, the CO2 coming from the ocean into the atmosphere. But, but later on, after the passage of the storm, so the, uh, the wind comes down, uh, sunlight comes up, <laughs> and, and then restratified the ocean become restratified. And in that case, you, you have this a growth of the phytoplankton bloom, right? So in, in that case, there's a biological drawdown of PCO2. And in that case, you, you will see the ocean become a larger sink. So I think really depends on the the timing of the, the storm, the strength, and, and also the translation speed. If the storm is moving really fast, then probably doesn't allow the nutrient coming to the surface and biological bloom. In that case, uh, uh, the net effect will probably just be the outgassing. Uh, on the other hand, if the storm is strong, moving slowly, you can generate more biological uh, reaction, larger blooms, and then large CO2 to draw down, make ocean become larger sink. So, so this is why I think um, really depends on the nature of the storm and, and uh, in terms of predictabilities, really depends on how well we can predict hurricanes. So that require a, a community efforts, right? Working on the hurricane forecast, 
the carbon science, the oceanographies to, to join for us. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again, and actually all four speakers. Uh, and I guess we're coming back at 10.10. Uh, so a little shorter break um, for the uh, first set of spotlight talks.